Welcome to the Psychovertical Podcast. It's me, Andy Kitpatrick. Another big gap. I do apologise in my podcasting. I keep trying to, I keep trying to get around to doing it, but I don't seem to I don't seem to have any time at the moment. So I'm here. I'm sat in the on the kitchen table, and I can see out the window. I can see Noah, and he's playing in the sand pit outside. Um, probably got the most expensive high. I can already hear his furry shout now. Daddy, I'm, I'm, I'm playing in the big pool of water or something. Um, probably got the most expensive uh, sand pit in the world. Uh, I was uh, around the back of our, our house. So this house we live in is uh, was kind of partly built by Vanessa, my wife's dad. Uh, but no one's no one's ever no one ever lived in it, and uh, it's kind of it's an interesting story. But we'll go into it anyway. But it was. Uh, um, I probably mentioned it before. It's some, some anyway. It's a very, <laughs> it's a very Irish thing. Anyway, so um, but around the back of his house, he had all this wood that he must have had, must have bought like thirty, forty years ago, and it was like really expensive kind of wood that would last forever, like some kind of Canadian, Canadian redwood or something, or some kind of you know sacred kind of fancy wood, and it was all. It must have, been, it must be pretty good wood. Could it be now in the in the horrific weather for years and years and years out, and it was still in quite a good condition. And then whenever he, whenever he came round, he'd always come round. He'd be like, uh, "Oh, look after that wood, you know. Be careful of that wood, you know. Don't do anything with it." Blah blah blah. And I was like, "Yeah, yeah." Anyway, so um, uh, anyway, so one day, I think one day, I think I was like paranoid about the the, the coming food apocalypse. So I started I started making loads of raised beds, and I. Uh, I uh, there was loads of wood all over this wood, wood all over the place. I was like finding general bits of wood. Some of it was like kind of rotten, but I was like putting, making like raised beds in one part of the one part of the garden. And uh, we have like a weird garden in the part. It's actually it's actually quite a big area. Like where we live, uh, where we live, it was a, a a farmer, and he basically was like the the he had like sixteen kids. And they lived, you know, it's like totally destitute. I think maybe in the last podcast I mentioned that, like, you know, there's a photograph. I went to someone's house and, and he's like one of the children who's, you know, he actually recently just died, that guy. But he, um, you know, had a picture of like his brother, like wearing a dress because he didn't have any, didn't have any enough money to buy him any, anything, any clothes. He had a hand-me-down dress. But anyway, the, but as the... So the farm, the only thing he had was this land that nobody wanted. It was the 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 land here is in, like incredibly full of rocks, like to the to like an insane. Like if you if you dig a like a meter deep hole, a meter by meter hole, you would end up with at least like two rocks the size of a size of a um, a microwave or something, and uh, and then a lot of other rocks of various sizes. It's just like. So it must be some kind of glacial spoil, wherever wherever this is. So yeah, so it was it wasn't really good for anything. You could you could put cows on it. So they had they had cows and things growing up. They only had some cows, so they basically lived off the milk from the cow and the. Then you know, probably had some horses and stuff, whatever. Um, but he, but as as each child left the ha- left grew up, they were given like a p- a piece of land that they would they eventually when they had money like a lot of them left Ireland and went to live in in England some went to live in America but when they came back and they had enough money then they would have this piece of land that they would they would like build a house on and then their their children then got some land and then they built houses on it so where we live is is like a lot of the people are all the same extended family and now you have like the grand the grandchildren have have got land that the building has on, so it's kind of it's uh, it's kind of interesting. So, uh, but I expect every generation of of the of the currens uh, is probably you know they're not having like 16, 16 kids. So anyway, so the, but this land is my my mother in law is is related to the current. So that is this is like her piece of land that you 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 got this piece of land and they built this house of like. 20 years or something like bit bit by bit so so yeah so it's kind of cool um anyway but they for some reason her dad had this great idea that he wanted to uh, build a 
make <laughs> build a tennis court in his back back garden. So it's quite, as I say, it's quite a big. Well, it's not a back. It's not a back garden. It's like a, a piece of la- like some land with just full of massive rocks and stuff. Like if you were a dwarf, and you have to be smaller than a dwarf. If you were like a uh, a fairy, not as in a you know like a, not as a nineteen seventies gay person. If you were like a you know a very s- small, it wouldn't be human. If you were um, like one of those guys out of um, a Willow or something, or some other small person. I don't, I don't know. I don't think Lord of the Rings has got any really small people in it. Uh, I can't really. Th- um, who's where's it? Anyway, if you like Tom Thumb or somebody, I don't know. Somebody, if you if you like the the Incredible Shrinking Man. But not to the point where you're the size of an atom. Um, then you'd be all right, yeah, because there'd be loads of rocks if you had to boulder on. Although you probably won't go bouldering. So, um, uh, yeah, so he had this idea he was going to build a tennis court because my wife was was really good at tennis, and which is kind of stupid because she like, she went to a tennis club. And she was she never became a professional because it was like it didn't have an indoor part of it and it's like in Galway so the weather is like horrific so you could only play, play tennis like for like five days a year so anyway so um she uh yeah he built this uh he built this this tennis well he didn't build a tennis court that's the problem he just built he just uh he just laid down a, a, a he made the flat part with a digger and then he like covered it with stones to like you know hard um just stones ready for eventually putting what was tarmac on top of it or whatever. We never got round it never got round to doing the tarmac. So uh so when I when I moved in here it was like literally like a you know, it was like a jungle. It was like on you know, you, you couldn't see out the windows because it was like it was just a jungle. So I started I went out there and I spent like a month or whatever, like trying to cut it all down, all this overgrowth. And I was like, oh my God, it's amazing. This is amazing. This, like, I've got this perfectly, perfectly smooth lawn. Like once, you know, I've got rid of all the, all the, all the stuff. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing. Where's Noah gone? It disappeared. Oh, there it is. Anyway, um, uh, anyway, so I thought it was going to be amazing. You know, it's like job done. I'll just, I'll just mow it all and then it'd be fine. And then I think I realized it wasn't grass. It was just, uh, like moss, so there was, so anyway, so I tried to dig into it, see what it was, and it was just it's just stones with like moss on top. So it's you know it's kind of it's not it's it's not really I don't know why I'm telling you this story. Anyway, so it's yeah, so yeah, not only have I got like a garden which is like fifty percent rocks, the best part of the garden is like ninety nine point nine 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 percent rocks, and the rest of it's like moss. So. Anyway, so but when I was building these uh, these raised beds, because I can't you can't really grow potatoes in in rock, uh, in rocks, uh, in stones. Uh, um, Vanessa was like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna make a sand pit." Like, this, this is the thing. I've, I'm re- the older I get, the more I kind of realize that the, the, the men and women are completely incompatible. And like I've gone, I really, I'm really going back to like a 1970s view of of men and women because I think it was probably actually more correct. I think um, because just men and women are just totally incompatible. And I think part of the, one reason why the world is going to hell is because women have got to, have been given too much. Uh, you know, it's like when people say like, "Oh, everyone's the same." That's just not true. Like if you travel around the world. It's just not true. Like people are very different, and uh, men and women are very different, and men and men are very different. So it's every you know anyway. But in but this is a this is a classic. Uh, so the, like the other day we dr- we're driving the car and we've got this like baby like two month old baby. So Venice is in the back with the baby, and because it's island, you don't bother with like seat belts or anything like that. And um, but um, she's like complaining. She's like worrying that the baby's got like got some sick on her. Over overalls or whatever they were uh, and I'm like Vanessa have you got your seatbelt on and she's like oh no and I'm like if we have a crash like it's, it's okay going in the back of the car just holding the baby and not sticking it in the car seat but you need to wear, you need to wear your seatbelt because if you do have a crash you're just going to squash the baby and she's kind of like uh, you know but that's a real different like she's worrying about the a bit of sick on her baby grow and I'm thinking about the baby dying. So it's like weird. 
anyway, but so I'm so I'm worried about the food apocalypse, and I'm like, you know, like trying to work, reading loads of books, and see how quick I can grow some potatoes. Or something you can blow, you can grow potatoes very well in Ireland. I know some of that might come as a shock. It's a uh, it's a great place for growing potatoes. Um, you know, and Vanessa's like, oh, I'm going to make a sand pit. Like, you know, like, I guess you could, what could you use a sand pit for? Like, nothing, basically. So, anyway, so she embarks on this, like, multi-week sand pit project, uh, if not month, and probably cost, you know, she ended up, she was like, we're like, we've got a fucking bloody beach, right? Like, we've got a beach just there. We could You could walk down to the beach and get, like, some sand. Anyway, but she bought some sand. She bought, like, 160 euros worth of sand. And, you know, it's like... It's just a different way, different way because it's cleaner that sand. Um, it's not it's not cleaner when the cat's been pissing in it and the whatever. But anyway, so anyway, I came down. What I came back one day and I was like, "Where do you get the wood for building that?" You've, like she built the walls of this like ginormous. It could be a swimming pool, basically. This ginormous. It's actually it's bigger than the beach. So um, I was like, "Where do you get that wood from?" She said, "Oh, my dad had all this wood around the back of the house." You know, so it's like so now it's it's probably one of the most deluxe uh you know people probably drive past and go christ those people must be wealthy in that house like look at the size of that look they're so rich they, they you know they've basically got a swimming pool but they've just filled it full of sand like that's how rich they are so actually speaking of it, i'm just going to check that noah's noah's disappeared out of the sand pit one second It's okay. It's lurking. It's lurking somewhere else. Actually, I, in in my in the food apocalypse, I started. I basically dug up loads of the garden, just trying to work out where I could plant some uh, something. And there's uh, there's loads of holes in the garden. He actually likes to play in those holes. They're not too deep. Anyway, so so yeah. So it's actually got. A, she built a. She made a lid for it. So once she built the sand pit, and then she put the sand in. That was like a massive multi-month project. It took her the whole of the summer. And then she uh, built this lid, which is made out of like plywood, which weighs, it probably weighs about 50 kilos uh, when it's dry, <laughs> which being where we live, it's it's never dry. So it probably weighs, it's getting like 70 kilos, 100 kilos when it's like wet. The only way to get it off is you can just lift up one corner and like pull it, slide it off. And if it goes all the way, then you'll never, you can't, it needs two people to get back on it because it's so heavy. So it's, uh, it's, <laughs> It's very uh, interesting. <laughs> Inter- uh, anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to bore you with all my first world problems at my sand pit. But it is actually, if you if you if you ever get the chance to build a sand pit for your kids, it is pretty good. Like he spends, he does actually spend, he, like he sleeps out there. You know, that's that's how good it is. Um, it's actually it's actually bigger than the house. So he's actually he's got, he's got like a cabana out there and stuff. It's uh, it's cool. Like people often come there. People often like land there in boats and like that's where Galway is. I'm like, this is actually the sand pit. Galway's up there. That's the beach is down there. So yeah, so sand pits are quite good. Uh, those plastic ones, like a big frog, are probably they probably cost you like thirty euros. Probably get one free off like Dundee or off eBay or something. So I just get just get one of them. And uh, I think the sand off the beach, like here, there's a lot of sewage. Like Ireland's got the largest number of septic tanks in in Europe. So uh, and the septic tank is just like a fancy way of saying you just shit and it goes in the river and then goes into the sea, and um, so yeah. So the water, so the I think the water is very polluted in Ireland. Like you don't want to swim with your mouth open and stuff. So that's probably it's probably not good to get the sand off the beach because it's probably got like condoms and tampons and things with ons in. So yeah. So yeah. So I've, I've so I have been meant, meaning to do this podcast another podcast for ages and ages and I've, I've i've noticed i've got this like build up of like emails from people asking me questions and usually i'd just answer i just reply but i've been like saving them so people are probably like oh god he's up himself i sent him this question you know and uh it's not replied to me so i do i do i do take these things i do you know I, you know, often people don't reply to me these days. I think they think i've gone crazy i'm actually i'm actually in a post crazy i've actually um I've actually changed my mindset about a lot of things recently. Um, uh, I think I've decided that I don't. I think I'm going to pretend that I don't care anymore. I'm going to. I'm going to care about the things I'm qualified to care about, 
um, I've got the, I've got this idea about you know if, if you saw lots of cows in a field and like jumped in there and you're like come with me come with me I'm going to save you all and you start trying to lift them over the the <laughs> lift them over the the wall and stuff you know yeah you probably get trampled on killed um, but also be kind of pointless because um, you know they just wander back in again so I, I've taken a bit of a I've taken a bit of a um, there's a, there's, a, there's a, someone my daughter sent me a podcast. Like I, de- I generally don't listen to people's recommendations because it's a bit like it's a bit like uh, recommended shagging somebody. Do you know what I mean? Like you might just you just it's just you just got to you know work these things out for yourself. So I um uh so I so sent me this podcast, but for some reason she sent me the wrong link or something. I end up I end up at a completely different podcast than the one that she wanted me to listen to. So it was a bit of a weird conversation where I was actually saying, oh, that's really interesting what they were saying. And she was, she was, you know, it was probably something about people shagging their kids or something. Well, I, she, she thought, was, she said, anyway. But um, I, I I listened to this podcast and it was that guy, like the happiness guru or something, who used to work for Google or something. And he was, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it was actually quite good. It was a bit about his son dying and stuff. Don't want to spoil it. But it, it was actually quite good. Um, but there was, there was this thing about... Um, you know, like during lockdown, like he, if he couldn't change, you can't change something, then don't don't think about it. You know, just just ignore it or something. Which my wife, I'll, like, I'll give it to Vanessa to listen to, and she 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 likes it. That that's the best bit. Like, but I think this like the idea of just not being bothered about anything is. I think if we all took that kind of attitude, then like nothing would nothing would ever change in a way like you'd still have you still have slaves and all that kind of stuff is like uh well they like it you know like they're not complaining you know all, all that kind of stuff so it is a bit of a i don't know it was a bit of a cop out but um i think for you i think do you know the get graham linham is it graham linham who you wrote, wrote father ted and the it crowd like he he's you know he's he's become like percent Passata non grata, persona persona non grata. You know, he's become you know like completely cancelled guy because he really went up against. He really didn't like the whole trans thing of chopping you know penises off boys and all that kind of stuff and chopping your your, your daughter's um, breasts off and all that kind of stuff. For some reason, you know, he's, he he's he really took against that. So and uh, but he used to be like a real like li- lefty liberal kind of person. You know, he was like you know like cancelling other people and think it was great but he's um he's, he's gone a, he's on a bit of a journey so i listened to some podcasts with him recently and I, you could see he was kind of he was uh you know, I, I don't know how far he's, he, along he is but he's i think i'm i feel like i'm much further on that journey than he is but he is still um uh he just sounds mental basically <laughs> you know because he's kind of schizophrenic like he's still got his guardian you know, reading, independent reading kind of mindset. Um, but he's uh, but he's kind of rebelling against it. It's kind of weird. It's probably like people like lose their, you know, start losing their religion, but all their, you know, all the kind of ways seeing the world is like biblical or something. I don't know. So I was like, oh, I don't want to be like that guy. You know, like I started, for, I started looking at his, his uh, sub stack and stuff. And I was just, after a while, it was, I was just getting like a message every day from him, like about, some something or other. I was like, oh god, it just gets a bit boring after a while. So, um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So I just like stop listening to him. So, um, so yeah. But anyways, but but one thing I one thing I've realised recently is uh, so so things that are actually what what can I do that's actually useful uh, to, to people? You know, if because if you if you keep rabbiting on about stuff that you that you uh, that enrages you, you know, like you know, sending tanks to Ukraine or whatever, you know, it's st- stuff to do, stuff that's actually kind of important, you know, World War Three and all that kind of stuff, you know, just ignore all that kind of stuff. Um, what can you do? Um, you know, what can you do that's actually useful? Um, but one thing I've, one thing I'd, I would pass on, rec- one thing I've noticed is I finally, you know, so I went through this phase of not having any mobile phone for a very long time, for like, for several years, and then I had to get a, when I moved back to Ireland, I had to get a dumb phone because of my bank and stuff. Like I can't do anything unless I can get a text message telling me yes, you can whatever. So you kind of anyway. So I, uh, uh, but I can't want I I I want to listen to audio books on Audible. I have like an Audible account, but I can't listen to I can't listen to 
and on anything for some reason. So I had to get so I bought a mobile phone, cheapest mobile phone I could have to to you know to be able to listen to Audible when I'm spending like spending basically. Like yes, he did like twenty one kilometers walking around with this baby, pushing this baby around. So I wanted I wanted it for that, but but literally it was like you know like uh, train stopping or something, train, train stopping, <laughs> train spotting, where it was like you know you just have a li- I'll just have a bit of heroin. Like I'm not having any heroin for ages. Like I'm sure I can have a little bit of heroin, and almost like immediately I was kind of right back in there of being this sight of a you know for an asshole of like you know on the kitchen table like sending a tweet or looking checking out maybe instagram followers i've got and all that kind of stuff and it really you could you can see how it's only when you stop and then you start again you can see you see how like how how bad it is and i i know i i really i i know at least i know one couple who split up because he, the husband could not stop being on his phone, and I know two couples who are on that are on that path, in that like, because and and I see it, I just see it like everywhere. You know, I'm sure you've seen it this yourself, and I'm sure you probably know yourself that you have the same problem. But it is, it is like, um, I don't know. It's been you know, like people talk about like porn addiction it'd be like someone like wanking you know you know in the street or in the cafe or wherever but you know like you'd be like oh my god that's that's kind of that's kind of unhealthy thing to be doing and um and kind of offensive and rude well i think i think the more the phone thing is 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 almost almost as bad really and yeah so it's it's a kind of a double-edged sword i have i have some i put some app on my phone so you know if you if you go on instagram or your emails or whatever um, it says like one minute, five minute, or fifteen minutes. And you can press on it, and it'll, you know, after one minute, it'll tell you, do you want to keep, you know? And I, I, that's that's the best I can do, really. Like I try not to have my phone. I try not. I try to just have my phone when I'm out outside. Like I don't take it into my into the bedroom. I don't, you know. I, t- I try. I'm trying to control it, but it is like, uh, God, yeah, it's a, it's a bloody toxic. It's a toxic thing, really. So. Anyway, but that's 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 uh, that's my uh, that's my news. So anyway, so I, I think I'm, I might try and crack on through some of these uh, questions. Like some of them are boring. Like no offense if you sent them, and some of them are uh, very interesting. So I shall I shall start with a very short one. This is from uh, this is from uh, J somebody. I won't say who it is. Um, Mr. Get Patrick, could you please tell me what your setup? What setup or most common rappel device and third hand you use for a single rope? And please also your favourite combo rappel device and third hand for double ropes. Also the brands. Thank you for taking the time. Write down. I think you might be from a foreign gentleman. So um, why would I guess when do you when do you rappel on a single rope? It's usually because it's like a fixed rope, I guess, isn't it? Um, or if you're doing some sort of blocking kind of thing, but generally, generally you rappel on two ropes, uh, single ropes. Like it, r- abseiling on fixed ropes is is can be kind of complicated because sometimes fixed ropes can be really bloated, like they can get really really fat because they've just been left somewhere for a long time. They absorb moisture or whatever. They get really stiff, and it's actually, it can be really hard to to get your uh, your device through it. Some sometimes if it's not too steep. You're you're often like better just going down like hand over hand on a on one of those kind of ropes if you can. Um, like there's a there's a there's a few like good techniques for you know where you use like carab like a carabiner break will often work better on a rope like that like a really knackered old rope than an actual belay device. Uh, especially if the sometimes the ropes are like often if you get a fixed rope often it'll be tied in somewhere else. And the rope can kind of shrink, so you you don't have enough rope to pull up to put through a device. So it's good to have some good, uh, like a figure of eight, sometimes easier to use, but most people don't carry figure of eight. Um, so I'll kind of, I'll, I'll kind of ignore that because you just you're basically just going to have your your the device you have. Like I did once have this device; it would only work on like it was a really skinny. I think it was like DMM bug bugette or something. It only worked on like skinny ropes, like you know, like eight and a half. Was it eight and a half ropes? The idea was that it'd give you a bit more control over the thing, but then, uh, 
But then I ended. I think it was in Alaska, and then I ended up having to have there was like a fixed fix rope, and it was like it was like a ten mil, and uh, it wouldn't fit in the device or something. So it's good. It's basically you want to have a a, ro- a, a belay device, r- rappel device that'll do everything. And the device I always use is uh, a Petzl um, Reverso, whatever the latest one is. And uh, like one one thing is always worth pointing out, unless you have a device that has like steel parts to it uh like my mom my mom have one with the steel parts on it they they do wear out belay devices and they can wear wear out quite rapidly like you can wear out a belay device if you're climbing kind of intensively like in six months definitely within a year and you don't want your belay device to wear out because it's uh you will actually notice a massive difference like if you say you're climbing on some really skinny ropes like like seven and a half mil rope and you're abseiling and it's free hanging and your ropes are uh, sometimes when your ropes are wet, they actually feel like they're. I guess they're heat, the grippy are out there on your hands, but they're not grippy in the device anyway. But sometimes you can be like rappelling, and you say you've got like a some rucksack or whatever, and it can be really hard to like control the ropes. So the the kind of the kind of designed, I guess a sweet spot is probably like eight and a half, eight nine to eight and a half where they're going to work. The, the best you know for paying out and fit and pet and feeding in and all that kind of stuff so um yeah so it's so i find that i find i've always found that, that those works really really well I, I guess you've got the the dmm version is this is the uh the pivot isn't it and uh and you got the the guide and all that kind of stuff the black diamond guide so so yeah so so you know belay devices are kind of belay devices i've not really used that, that many different ones for uh for a while um and then to be to be honest i tend to still a lot like I, in my book down there's like loads of ways of of uh, backing up your your belay device when you're out rappelling i still just go with the uh the hand wear um just for you know if you're if you're just rappelling like down one pitch or something, and you're start stopping and starting, uh, I'll generally just do it like that. But if I've if it's like a longer rappel, then I will go to the um, you know like if if I've got like a you know if it's more if it's a more kind of intense period of rappelling like over a long way with like hanging belays and you know all that kind of stuff, then I'll just go with the like a sling uh, off my belay device off my belay loop. And I'll have my belay device like halfway up the sling, uh, with a carabiner at the, the top, clipping in and out, and then I'll have my my prusik loop on the uh, on the belay loop. So I'm just it's all kind of like in line, which which is kind of the best way to do it. And there's various ways of you can lark's foot the sling rather than ta- rather than lark you can lark's foot the sling in the way where you end up with, like you don't have actually any knots that need untying. There's there's various ways of doing it. Uh, uh, just do it the way that's the most obvious way to you, really. Um, so yeah, so that's a very, that was an that's an easy one to to do. Like there's 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 basically there's off there's there's always like a better way. Like it like having it having your belay device on your I'm um, having your 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 you know backup loop your third hand your prusik loop your friction hitch on your leg loop is not like the ideal way of doing it. But it is the it is the easiest, you know, the balance of everything. It's kind of, it kind of it works it works well, and you know, it's it's universally used. You know, you can like there there are you know yes, there were, technically there's better ways of doing it, but it's just is it works it works it works well. So you know, so yeah. Um, so this is the this is a more complicated one. Uh, this is. Uh, I was wondering if I should keep the person person's name secret. Um, I'll change the I'll change the thing. So, hello Andy. Uh, carefully carefully read through your content online and learned a, few, a lot of things. I want to attempt the two um, two hundred and seventy mile bikepacking race. Uh, it should take me around eighteen to twenty four days. The weight and speed of camp setup packing are absolutely key. I am still debating what to do as there and, and there is no perfect answer, but I was hoping you could guide me to make the best choice. The route goes from do um, uh, to do through the do <laughs> altitude record. 
altitude varies between 4,000 feet and 8,000 feet most of the time. Uh, it's a good job I can tell the difference between feet and inches there. Most of the unless it's someone who goes bouldering in the garden, most of the time in June the temperature drops to near zero Celsius, or let's say minus two to ten Celsius. Last year I've I've done a lot of test ride. I've done a, a test ride using the outdoor research bivy and a two degree down bag, but it turned out to be terrible. One night I was scared myself. I scared myself shivering out of control in the middle of the night. Oh, Noah's coming out of the sandpit. He's heading this way. Typical. I'm riding this road. God, he walks so weird. Oh, my God, he's falling over. Uh, it's okay. It's on the it's on the, it's on the, uh, tennis court. Uh, right. Um, he walks like some sort of uh, like cockney gangster for some reason. I can hear him. Is he coming in? He's coming in. What do you want? Oh, Christ. Noah? I think he might be distracted by something. To avoid getting all my gear soaking wet, I would remove clothes and put on my dry base layer. But dressing back up in the morning was just as an awful process. Plus, having to dry everything every day took me valuable time. When I look at the gear from the woman who holds the record for this race, she was wearing a vapour barrier hot sack from Western Mountaineering. She was using a vapour barrier hot sack. It sounds like she would keep all their clothes on, long sleeve base, down vest, hard shell jacket, down pants or bottom. Sounds like a very quick setup and no sleeping bag. Last year's winner went with another approach, carrying on the emergency bivy and relying on motels when he could. There a fair good amount there is a fair good amount of hotel could be hard to coordinate the timing. But anyway, so my question is, if I'm going to carry only a bivy sack or a vapour barrier hot sack, no sleeping bag, should I go with something breathable or not? I think I would use the motels when I can and and try and snap or do snack, a snap, nap, or do short block of sleep when outside rather than a full night. And ride through the rain to keep warm rather than stopping, although that's easier said than done. I understand none of these options are great, but the goal of winning the race when options would be suggested. Oh. It's coming in. It's coming. Yes. I'm doing a podcast. I'm doing a podcast here. What do you want? Do you want some popcorn? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what this is? Yeah. I'm speaking to my to my people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to pause this. Aren't I. I'm gonna have to go and sort, sort you out. Do something with you. <laughs> okay. I shall carry on this in uh, shortly. Right. I'm back. I'm determined to get this bloody podcast finished. This is about three days after my last attempt, and after I've had several attempts in between, I seem to be getting a losing my voice as well. So <laughs> all this trying to get this stupid podcast done. So anyway, so my son is back in the garden, and uh, so hopefully he'll he'll stay out there. So I see if I can remember what that last uh, that email was about. Some cyclist going cycling. So I think uh, it sounds like. I sometimes if you're trying to come up with some solution to uh to a a problem like that you're best kind of casting around to see what other people do in sort of similar circumstances now it seems like it seems to, to be important that you can sort of deploy your system super quickly and you can gather it up super quickly and it has to be kind of lightweight can't be bulky uh, it also probably needs to have like a high degree of um, high degree of uh, robustness and kind of survivability in sort of strict, you know, sort of not ideal conditions. So you might be, you know, you might be stopping and trying to sleep when you're soaking wet, which is uh, not ideal. Um, 
uh, ideally you don't want to be like getting to hotels and sleeping in hotels and things like you said but you what you uh you you need a like a traditional like camping system where you stop and you put up your put up your tent and you get your sleeping bag out and all that kind of stuff like first of all you know you're gonna end up having like you're gonna have to have like panniers and all that crap and you know before you know it you're your tiny tent gets, you know, bigger and your sleeping bag gets bigger and then you need, you have like a mat and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so you need, you need like a system where it will fit on your bag, fit on your bike probably without any kind of panniers and you can literally have it up and in your sleeping bag in, you know, in 60 seconds or something and then, you know, packed away and, and zooming off again. Uh, like I've covered this in the podcast before, but you, if you're doing like multi, multi day kind of, uh, things like this, <coughs> yeah, you, re- you really want to be sleeping, um, on like, you know, like 15 minutes to 40 minutes, uh, every four hours, uh, and then you can like maintain that over like a long period. So you're probably, just, you know, you probably cycle until you're really, really tired, and then you just kind of like crash, crash out, get in your get in your sleeping bag, you know, have like fifteen minutes to forty minutes. Your alarm goes off, you know, jump up, shove everything in, uh, cycle off again, and repeat every every four hours until you until you get to the end. Uh, if you got to like a motel, then you could you know you could potentially sleep for longer. If you wanted to, but once you sleep over forty minutes, you need to be sleeping, you know, like a few hours really. To to otherwise, you you know you you'll feel worse. You'll feel worse for it. So anyway, so you want you need a system. You need you need some form of shelter and you need some form of insulation to to sleep in. Like a, a some kind of a vapor barrier bag is basically like a, a plastic bag. So you know if you were if you're super hardcore. You know, you could just basically just carry a plastic bag, like a survival bag. You'd, like I wouldn't. Well, I guess, you know, if you had like a, a silicon, you know, silicon nylon, you know, bag or something, it would probably be like that's probably probably a lightest kind of, hundred percent waterproof, hundred uh, percent not breathable kind of system, and you would just kind of uh, jump into it with all your cl- all your clothes on, and then you would like really really like suffer and freeze your ass off and sort of boil in the bag so you really want a system where you want you don't you'd like you know that you'd have to be like so tough to to do it like that you know you might as well just buy a plastic one of those plastic survival bags it'd be a lot cheaper for like you know five euros and just shove it in (laughs) shove it somewhere and just get in just get into it you know sleep 15 minutes get up keep going and uh, just try and warm up on your bike, but it would be really, it would be really grim. Like that, you know, m- most human beings can't can't do that for over and and perform. You know, your 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 morale would be so low, you'd you'd just like you'd crash and you'd just give up because it'd be just, just be too miserable. Um, so so one one group of people to look at for this kind of thing would probably be the the army, like army type army types. <laughs> Because they they generally um, are going to be uh, going somewhere, and then they're going to stop, and then they're going to have to rapidly set up some kind of sleeping system, and then they're, they're going to have to rapidly break that sleeping system down and sort of head off and carry on, and so they're they they're kind of the the army army t- types are basically the people who's de- developed the whole tarp thing or basher as you call it in the uk is which is basically like a eight foot by six foot piece of um nylon and uh, with grommets or what there's various there's there's various types some of them wear absolutely nothing like they're silicon nylon they wear basically nothing like bag of crisps or something and so they would uh in, in the military you generally um that you'd have like two Basically, in the military, there's like two. You have, you're in a team of two. You know, like two people. Your your buddy, whoever it is, and then that, is it like a platoon that's made up of you know multiple <laughs> multiples of two? Is it like ten twos? Is it twelve people? I'm not sure. Anyway, you know. So so basically, but your your foundation 
unit in the military is two people and then it like builds up from there so you uh there's two people and they both have a a top a top uh one person puts their top on the floor as a ground sheet the other person using various methods cord like power cord bungee loops whatever then they they they'd, they'd kind of create a, a shelter it could be like a ridge you know like a um you know you you attach the the tarp um in the middle of the the longest section and then you sort of bring it down to like tent pegs or something so you create like a tent shaped tarp or you could have a tarp which is a you know it's all it's a it's it's an angle it's hard to do on a podcast anyway you basically make some kind of top cover from for your to keep the rain off you and 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 you can keep the wind off you and stuff but you have to you know you have to pitch it very low now in the military uh they tend to pit they'd probably pitch it very low down to the ground so they'll get shot and uh they'd actually dig a i think if you're in in actual war you'd actually you actually dig a hole so you'd have your your tarp is over the top of your hole like a shell scrape so it's like like a foot deep it's not like a trench just like you know so you just you just kind of under the level of the ground um and uh so the 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 bottom tarp is folded over so it's smaller than the than the footprint of the of the top tarp so the water doesn't all come in there and uh but if you're not going to get shot then you you can have the tarp a bit higher and a, t- a tarp unless you've actually slept in a tarp a tarp is actually very very effective and is in in many ways it's actually a lot drier and a lot more comfortable than sleeping in a tent because there's no there's there's very little damp air because all the air kind of um is just like blown away so you so you're not like if you get into a if you're really really wet and you get into a tent and everything's wet your gear's wet the tent is probably often wet if you have to get into it really 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 wetly then it just creates a real funk of kind of wetness and and everything else is pretty uh, pretty grim. Where if you actually have a if you actually have a tarp uh, and you pitch it properly, so you you're trying to sort of block the wind and things, and you have like dry insulation underneath the tarp, you know, like a dry sleeping bag, dry clothes and stuff, then it it, it can actually be like more comfortable than um, you know like than being in your tent. That's why it's often. If you're ever doing like a long trip, you're often much better to bring a really like a good sized tarp and and a much smaller tent than you think you need. And a lot of the time, you're actually you're not going to be in the tent. You're going to be like under the tarp. But same with if you're on a like a big expedition, you'll often have a you know create like a an area where you're going to cook and and do everything outside of where your tent is. You know your tent can be like a tiny little tent. We have a much bigger sort of living space, so it's again, again, it's like it's kind of your you're kind 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 of creating like a living space, um, but here it's like a a place to bivy, but you're going to bivy like super 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 quickly, and uh, like if you if you you know if you've got trees and stuff, it's kind of easy or boulders or whatever, um, but in this case you've got a bike, so there are like methods very quick methods of like using a bike with a tarp so you probably just you just throw your bike upside down on its handlebars and you just um you know put the tarp up um over the top of the bike the front of the the front of the the front of the tarp is you know is on the front of the bike then you bring your two guy lines down and then you just like peg out the back so you could have you know you could have your your tent set up in you know in 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 60 seconds so and, and I would say like a tar a, a a very high quality tarp uh will is the size of a like a tennis ball or something it packs down to almost nothing and it's you know if you if you go for some kind of like you can get quite a lot of um like some tarps super heavy duty but you, you can get some which are like military spec ones which have like webbing webbing that runs along the edges uh with with you can you make it into a stretch basically it's like super hardcore you know if you if you if you have like a super lightweight tarp and someone breaks a leg and you try and you know six of you each person grabs like a corner and two people grab the middle and try and carry someone out it's probably going to split and the person's going to fall out where like a military one you tend to you tend to have a uh, the two long sides have got like tape on them, so they're reinforced. And then the center, 
line has tape on it as well. So what you do is you kind of f- flip it over. So you've got two layers of fabric where the person's being um, waiting it. Like most, a lot of hammocks, if you ever look at a hammock, it, hammock is like super lightweight material, but it's actually two layers of it. So it kind of re- reinforces each other. But, you know, you don't, want, you don't want something like that. You want something as like light as possible. Now, I don't know who makes... Like the is it Cascade? Yeah, anyway, but Rab Rab bought them. But there's loads of people who make them, and you can make them yourself. You can buy that that really lightweight um, nylon, silicon nylon. Uh, so so I, that's what I would recommend in in you know just getting out of the getting out of the elements. Now it takes some practice, and you need some um, you need to cut you need some tent pegs. You know maybe you take like four tent pegs. You could use like a knife, a fork, whatever. But, you know, get some really lightweight, tiny little tent pegs. You can use other things, but a tent pegs kind of good to have. And and some cord. And you could just use, like, you know, like, two mil Dyneema or something. You could, get, you could go, like, super, 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 super lightweight. And so, yeah, so that, that that's, that's what I'd recommend as a way of just getting your head underneath something. And... uh then when it comes to what you're going to sleep um what's going to keep you warm now i would i would look at i would look at something you want something that you can just throw over you and fall asleep you want something as light as possible and um that also but also that's kind of robust so if you end up sleeping in a like you know when you're a climber you often end up sleeping in like some grotty old toilets and it's all wet or something or you sleep in a bus stop or um you often can't be choosy about where you sleep so there will often be it can be damp and stuff uh, and that's the problem even with like a down sleeping bag is uh even in a tent a down sleeping bag is can be a bit of a liability and it's kind of stressful you you want you want something where if you fall in a river you could you know you could still you know get ring it out and sleep in it <coughs> sorry um so a good a good uh thing i would look at is 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 a quilt now you could you could you could buy a quilt like a you, know, you could get like a down a down quilt which would be you know like moderately expensive probably less expensive than the actual sleeping bag or you could you could make one um, but i would i would probably i would either look for to buy or make yourself just a a um, a quilt out of sort of a synthetic sort of insulation, so then you don't have to worry about it getting wet, and uh, you, you know it's like one less thing to stress about. Like even if it's on your bike and it gets wet, or you fall in a river, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Like it's not going to be as warm if it's wet, but if you if you wring it all out and get all the water out of it, um, it's still going to you know keep you warm. Which which is that, something made out of down isn't, isn't going to do that. And the um, the material you want, the, the insulation you want to use is um, climb uh, climb shield, which is the be- the best kind of insulation, <coughs> the best kind of insulation for that kind of thing. And because it comes it comes in a sheet, it's it, you know like a lot of uh, synthetic insulations. They're like you'll buy like a brand new top of the range sort of Patagonia synthetic duvet jacket uh, like a like a softy kind of jacket but you'll often find very quickly the insulation starts like breaking apart and you've got lots of cold gaps that it kind of floats around and it's kind of a bit like down really it's a, it doesn't it looks great in the laboratory tests and you know but it's not it's, it's often not so good over a long period where climb shield uh, is is it's got some kind of scrim attached to it, so it's actually like a a wad. Is it a wad? Uh, anyway, it's like a big wedge of material, so it's actually very stable. So if you if you have a, a quilt made out of it, you can make it quite easily. Uh, like I've made like quite quite a few myself. For some reason, I always lose them. But anyway, so that so you can make something like that. You could you could have to if you're a woman, you're probably going to sleep a bit colder than a bloke like ideally if you was two of you then you then you you could get away with something very thin and just like buddy up which which is um like very effective but if there's just one of you then it's worth carrying that extra bit of insulation to 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 stay warm 
Now, I would also definitely, it's no use having like a thinking about something to sleep, get, you know, sleep, a sleeping bag kind of system if you don't have something to sleep on. So I would definitely invest in in some kind of, uh, you know, like mat. It could be like the, if you get like the lightest weight, three quarter thermarest kind of mat you know just get just get the lightest thing the lightest most compact thing you can if you can't get a compact one you know like a a roll mat or something is gonna have to fit on your bike somewhere um but probably a th- some kind of therm rest but the problem with therm rest it's actually you're gonna waste some time blowing up potentially but uh you really do need something to to, to lay on like you could you could what would you, what would you have to lay on your pump or something your inner tubes you haven't really got that much to to you know to to lay on unless you could find somewhere where you're laying on stuff that's you know not not too hard but but if it's if you if it's cold and wet and muddy and you're not going to carry some kind of ground sheet going into your tarp then having having a you know having a well I guess it I would probably carry like a some some piece of material to to stick your your thing on otherwise you are going to get really mucky and dirty anyway so um yeah so you what you want you kind of you do want to sort of strip off all your your wet clothes if you can because that's kind of going to be grim and i would just like strip off all your wet clothes uh until you're naked and then just get this then you know just what's the point of like putting on dry clothes if you're going to be getting up again in in 40 minutes and setting off again it's 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 kind of pointless um and if you get in there with all your wet clothes you're not they're not going to dry in that in that time and it's just probably going to be miserable so you're just going to have to be really tough and just like strip strip down and strip it you know you could lay it you could lay on top of it i guess um that might dry it a little bit but and it and then it'd be kind of body temperature when you put it back on again but like it in the in the past like putting wet clothes on was seemed to be quite common like having having done like long long sea kayaking trips you are you generally only have like a wet a wet wet clothes and dry clothes you have one set of wet clothes which is what you're kayaking in and one set of dry clothes which you wear when you're not kayaking and you know you do you do kind of have like a big you just dump all these wet clothes at the end of the tent or wherever and then put your dry clothes on and try not to get them wet, you know, going out to get water and stuff. And then you've got to put them back all, all on again, which can be grim. So like selecting the right kind of clothing is kind of is paramount. Like any of the, you know, like anything that anything that you can wring out and that will warm, you know, the, anything you can wring out, wring all the water out and it's going to, um, the moisture in it, uh, it's gonna is gonna warm up rapidly. So that's the thing. Like you're not gonna get the water out of your clothes, but you want the water in your clothes to warm up to body temperature as soon as possible. And that can take, you know, if it was like a, if it's a wet pair of jeans, you know, you you you're you're gonna struggle. But if it's um, like a power stretch top or an R1 top or something that it don't generally has to be kind of. Um, fit fit quite well and you're gonna have to like block the wind because the wind is gonna is you're gonna be battling the wind to try and like the wind actually does actually dry dry the fabric as well the wind passing through the fabric is actually dry is actually drying it it's taking moisture away but it is also like freezing you and making you cold so you, you can't generate you're not pumping up the heat that dries it out so it's kind of a balance between the two but you know you want you want to pick your 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 active layer that you're going to wear when you're cycling that's going to be appropriate for you know what you're doing so you you're not in the idea of like doing a multi-day trip and thinking your waterproof is going to keep you dry is, is is not going to happen you're going to just going to be wet so you're you're almost better adopting a system which is going to like slow down the like the ingress of water into your system but then it's just going to keep you um warm even when you're going to be sort of damp and stuff um and isn't going to chafe you and you're going to get a lot of salt in your clothing from sweat and that's also going to make it harder for your clothes to dry to like fully dry they're always going to feel damp after a while so it's a yeah it's it's like a really it's a tough it's a tough thing like if you got to 
if you got to a hotel and you're really wet, one thing you need, you want to do is just wash all your clothes in the shower and get the salt out and then see if you can, even if it's, even if you can't dry it, it'll, it'll actually dry a lot easier when you're, when you're wearing it, if you get rid of all the, the salt out of it. So, so yeah, it was, it sounds, <laughs> it doesn't sound very appealing. This, uh, this race, if you got to do all this kind of stuff, um, you know, if you, if I guess if you were like super, if you're super hardcore, what would you do? I guess you would just you would just get a, a tarpaulin. You'd uh, yeah, if you wanted to be super hardcore. So another thing to get is a is a warby, which is a, it's basically so you got the, so like a uh, your tarpaulin is based on a on a, it's basically based on a poncho. So in the past, in the military, you get a poncho, which you know, like a poncho with a hood on it, and people would like, if you had to sleep, you would tie the hood off, tie a knot in the hood, and then you would like, you know, like, you know, suspend the the top or the um, the poncho and sleep underneath it like a tent, and maybe you'd like snap two together to make it. like some some of them, like some countries, you have. You have the the poncho things can be connected together to make like a a teepee and all sorts of stuff, but um, but anyway, so so one thing one thing that existed or probably still exists is a warby, a wooby warby, which is a like a liner that goes inside the poncho. So if you're wearing the poncho and it was cold, it's like a synthetic synthetic blanket basically that fits inside the inside the 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 poncho thing. And it's like, probably like snaps in with some snaps or something. Um, so some people like just carry, like in the military, they would just carry one of those, and they would sort of wrap themselves up in it. <laughs> by, by sounds of it, it's like they're not they're not that warm. So, but you know, but you, if you're like super hardcore, you would just carry, you know, you carry your poncho and your and your warby, and you would just or a tarpaulin in a warby, or but you know, like make up a a bag, you know, like a out of this tar, out with this material, like a like a survival bag and you would like wrap yourself up in your in your warby and you would just crawl into it and sleep for 40 minutes and then get up and carry on and you just sleep with all your wet clothes on or whatever um uh what else could you do i guess you like it's very important to like have a lot of calories if you know if you if you're absolutely ta- if you're actually knackered and you're really starving you're not going to be generating any heat the, the, like the heat you're generating when you're cycling is going to taper off very quickly as soon as you stop. So then you're just going to, you know, you're going to really going to be like, really going to be suffering. Uh, like spotting the good places to stop. Like often if, if you're on like a, you know, if the weather's like hor- horrendous, you know, you can get to a spot where you, where you're like, you're, you're protected behind something like a boulder or a dry stone wall or something. And suddenly it feels like really, really warm. Like you're like, oh, I could, I could just like sleep here because it's so warm. And you kind of like lay down, and within about five minutes, you're just like you're freezing your ass off. And you're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna sleep in those. Like if you're freezing your ass off, you're not gonna sleep. So it's pointless even stopping. Like if you're absolutely exhausted, then maybe you'll sleep. But it's, it's kind of, it's kind of pointless. Like maybe you just better just going, just keep going. You know, let's go slower or, um, you know, if it's, you don't want to do this when you're cycling, but you can sleep. You can sleep when you're uh, when you're moving as well. Like you have like uh, micro naps where you just you uh, you're walking and then you suddenly realize you were asleep. And then, then you're like, oh, my God, I was asleep. And then you and then you'll fall asleep again. And uh, I, can, I, won't, I think I've experienced that a few times. <laughs> but one, once when I tried to solo El Cap in the day, I was having these like. I was in the middle of like leading a pitch, and I'd suddenly realised I was as- I was asleep. So, but that was when you not know, slept for like forty hours or something. So, so yeah, so it's yeah. It's, but I guess with all these things, you just you just, you just need to keep practicing it. You need to go out and really suffer. But you probably suffer so much that you'd be like, oh, I'm not going to do this race. So you maybe you don't want to practice it too much. Um, it's like it's like it was like a thing. Don't train for something that could kill you. You know, just do it. Uh, you know, if you, I think someone said they were gonna. I think I had to jump out of a plane into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the sat the southern like, uh, yeah, the southern ocean out of a plane, and they said, "Why practice? Just, just do it." Um, so yeah, I think that's it. If you if you had to draw, if you had to change into some clothes, um, 
like one of the best things to carry for changing in and out of is actually the call in the again back back to the the military is they had this thing called a zoot suit which i think came about because when people were in the jungle um so if you're in the jungle it's really really hot and sweaty so uh, at night you'd put your uh again you put your tarp up and you put your your hammock on, up underneath it and then you want to change out of all your wet clothes otherwise you're gonna really suffer you know inside your sleeping bag inside your inside your hammock so you um so people have this thing called zoot suits which actually i think in the second world war that's probably where they came from they were made out of parachutes parachutes like basically silk pajamas made out of uh old parachutes so it's just um, trousers with like a, a drawstring and uh, a, uh, like a top. And some some of them would have a hood. Like if, I guess, I don't think they wouldn't stop a mosquito, but the you know, like a hood's kind of a useful thing. And then, so this was like a classic item that people would get made like in Hong Kong and places where there's lots of, if, you, if you're going through Hong Kong, you'd get someone to make you, there's lots of tailors in Hong Kong apparently. You, you know, get, and then in, like in the UK, like if you were in, like my brother, he was down at like Bryce Norton where all the paras would be training. It'd be some guy in Bryce Norton who was really good with a sewing machine and he'd be making these things for people and people's wives were making them. You see, you can still see, you can actually buy like like a Zoot Soup um, stuff online and, and some of it's like super cheap. It's made out of like the, the thinnest kind of nylon you can get. Um, like Pertex... Pertex is probably the best material to get it made out of because it because it wicks. Pertex is like one of the best like wicking materials. So if you're like damp and you put on this, uh, you put your zoot suit on your your bottoms and your top, is it just it just absorbs all the moisture into the fabric immediately. Then it wicks it over the fabric. Um, you know, it sort of takes the the water molecules and it sort of spreads them around, and then it then it rapidly, you know, you you feel dry very quickly wearing it, and then your body heat dries out the fabric super quickly. So, uh, yeah, so like, so I've used I've used um, that kind of principle for kayaking, and it works it works really well. Like you can, it's amazing amazing how comfortable and warm you can be wearing just a layer of of nylon basically like like pair text top and bottom so very yeah really really good um but prob- probably you know like if you if you were you could probably have some sort of cycling system where you were just cycling in your in your zoot suit and then you just jump off your bike and anyway i don't know anything about cycling so I'll stay stay away from it um how long have i been talking uh i'm a kind of a i'm kind of a aware that i'm that my voice is the voice is sounds a bit weird so i did have a let's have a look what any other got some other questions here uh, before my before my son reappears that's asking me asking me for something i gotta take my daughter out for a walk in a minute um don't want to spoil it don't want to don't give you all these problems uh let's have a look i got i got like a, a file here with loads of stupid questions in um so this is a, this is one from I'm doing this the wrong way around actually because I'm, it means the people who asked them longest ago are getting them answered. So anyway, hi Andy, thanks for your recent podcast, the one with the Yamaha outboard repairs in the background made an interesting <laughs> interesting listening. I have actually been doing um, I'm like training because because I've had this like all this baby crap to deal with. I haven't been able to do anything. I haven't been able to do any work or anything. And I'm just coming out of it at the moment, and I'm just, uh, I'm just, tra- I, I'm just doing like weight training, like every day. Like I'm basically walking up to like twenty kilometers a day, pushing this pram. So I'm at, that that's for kind of exercise, and but I, um, I am, but I've just started going back and doing like weight training, just because it's, just because it's kind of I kind of like it, and uh, it bit. And it's just kind of, it's just kind of, I, I can't, you know, it's, it's simple and I kind of like it. So, so yeah. <laughs> so I just do, I basically do like every other, I do, uh, so what on one day I do, um, I do overhead press and deadlift. And then the next day I do bench press and squat 
and then and that's it. Like I just do, just just change every other day. I'm just doing those things, not doing anything else. And I do like um, three sets of five. So and I I only I I basically go up by one kilo every day on everything until the point where I'll it'll get too heavy and I'll have to start changing and doing it every every you know spread it out more 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 whatever so it's um it's kind of easy to do and you can start and it and I, whenever I do this I always start way below like the the the, the with with like weight training for me I you're always aiming at say doing um like a body weight bench press body weight overhead press double body weight squat double body weight um deadlift and um you know, you're always you're always kind of getting towards that point. You know, after like months or years of doing it, and then as soon as you stop after a while, you always like you, you always drop back. It's like climbing; you drop that back. You know, you never drop back. Like you, like you, the muscle memory of learning how to lift up weights is is with you. So you you got your technique doesn't really go away. So you can always move quite heavy weights just because you know how you know how to do it. But um, you, you know your strength. You do notice your strength goes down. So I always like start back again. So I'd start at, like half body weight. So you'd start, you know, for me at like fifty kilos, and you'd start working back up again. So you know, to begin with, it's like seems very easy, and then you by the time it gets harder, then you're you know you don't you don't want to be starting. You like today I was listening to uh, Garth Marenghi. I don't know if you've ever seen Garth Marenghi's. Dark Place Channel Four TV program, very funny. Anyway, I was listening to his. his uh, he's got like an audio book. The the guy who wrote it, which is kind of funny. But I was like trying. I was doing like a overhead press, and suddenly he said something that was like really, really funny. And it um and and uh, and yeah, I almost like dropped the weight on my head because you because you can like bleed. You you kind of you're like bleeding this your your power, your strength, and your power by laughing. So anyway, so I, I it's it's it's, uh, it's good, and you can I can I can generally get it done in the afternoon, like in in when uh, Noah's having his nap. So I can get it done in like I think the fastest I can probably get it done is like half an hour, and I have like two bars. So so I'm so one you know so I'm warming up on one bar, and then when I when I start that I start warming up on the other bar, and then they kind of overlap. Otherwise, it can take quite a while to to do one and do another one so anyway um i did have this idea did this idea actually right of doing a book called uh because i've been like because i've <laughs> a book about my wife's like oh that sounds like a terrible idea i had this idea i always have these stupid ideas for books like i i have like so many ideas for books and loads of them are so you know they never they never happen and i've and i've always got books ongoing like i have at least I have at least two books I'm going. I have one that's basically written and one that's half written. And the the one that's written, I've just got to do the the diagrams for it, which takes forever. But um, but I have this. I, was, I had this idea about writing this book. Um, it's called Belly Timber, and it's about it's about um eating and exercising, and it's kind of like a like a pig farmer. Like this rush, my rush, my um. My German translator, he has a thing about you know pig farm, pig farmer philosophy, which is like you know someone's view of something that they have nothing, you know it's it's just like a, it doesn't matter because it's just you're just a pig farmer. What do you know? But um, I think I, I think my uh, my relationship with food and and weight and all that kind of stuff has been I think it's been like very interesting over my life, like because. Unlike a lot of people, like often I had to get really fat. So if you're going on a big trip where it's going to be cold and whatever, you kind of had you had to get really you know you, to, you need to put weight on basically. I remember when I went to Antarctica, I had to have a medical, and the, when I had the medical, the guy was like, "Oh, I'm afraid you're obese." I was like, "Yes," and uh, you know, often you go on a trip and the people who were like super horned and you know they were really would like start falling to pieces after a while because they had no. They had no belly timber, basically. But anyway, but I like I actually think it's I actually think it's really easy to lose weight. And I think one of the problems about losing weight is people think it's difficult, but it's actually really really simple. It's almost like it's almost <coughs> it's not it's not it's not fun to lose weight. 
but it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And 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 um, like I'm, I'm basically lo- I'm basically losing weight now because I got really fat. Like I have I have this jacket that if I can't zip it up, I know I'm fat. Basically, I've got my, like a Montane waterproof jacket. If it won't zip up, I'm like, oh, I'm too fat. I need to lose some weight to get this jacket to fit on properly. And um, so so that's basically like when I get really that fat, I might like, right I have to lose some weight. And and I can always like lose lose the weight quite easily. I can lose about 10 kilos, um, 10 to 15 kilos of weight, which is uh, like a shit ton of weight. Like at the moment, I'm, I'm when I'm doing these walks with my child, I often carry like five kilos in, in a bag on my back, some rucking as they call it these days. And it's like, God, like five kilos is bloody heavy. So to lose like 10 kilos or five, you know, it's like, I can basically down... Uh, six kilos from like when when I started, but the weird thing is is uh, like my my diet involves like um, eating like ice cream and stuff. Like I'll have like a whole tub of Hagen Dazs ice cream or something. You know, just that's it, just for the, for the whole week. No, but no, but I like, I like I'm eating like mini. I really like mini eggs when it's Easter. If you're American, maybe you don't know what those are, but they're just like mini eggs, but they're not real eggs. Um, made out of chocolate, chocolate eggs. And they're probably like seven seven hundred calories or something. So so yes, it's kind of a it's kind of a weird a weird kind of diet, but it's kind of uh, it is is very it's very effective. But I don't know why. Like, I think if I looked into it, like who's that Huber? Is it the Huber man? Huber Huber guy? He always writes about diets and all that kind of stuff, and you know, optimum fitness is uh, so yeah. So I had this idea about writing this book, and and half of it would be my interesting stories about my relationship with uh with food and and uh like I, I wouldn't say i've ever been on a diet but i just kind of change what i'm eating and some things are you know some things are are really good and and some things are really are not really are really not really good it actually it's actually be a book where you could just condense it down to like like two pages or something a few pages um but it's like uh yeah, if anybody's got any diet, if anybody wants any diet advice, like no, it's not diet advice. It's just it's like it's like you just need to make you just need to make what you eat really really simple. So you basically have to eat the same thing every single day. You don't have to eat this. It's not the same meal, but you basically your life your life is so fucking boring that you have to fill in you have to fill it in with all this food, this fancy food, and it's the same way. Do you know when people say or people are often you know, people want to buy things because it makes them feel, um, you know, it makes them feel complete or they think it's going to make them happy, like having a, a Porsche or whatever, iPhone, iPhone 20 or something. But it, but it doesn't. And the food is kind of the food is kind of the same as that you saw. You know, when you go for your coffee, you want to have your cake, and when you want your blah blah blah. Um, so, but 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 basically, you just, that you just have to sort of knock that on the head and realize that's just it's a bit it's a bit like also you're not a child like why are you eating like a child eats like going buying eating lots of haribo or something like they can't help, help themselves but you can so um mini eggs don't count and uh and ice cream's like a superfood someone told me so yeah so the so the, the this sort of diet is basically having like eating lots of food in like an, you're never you're not really hungry when you when you're on the Ket Patrick the Ket Patrick belly timber diet you're never hungry but you're also not like super excited oh no you ask but it, there's like this thing about eating really boring food like if you ever go on a, if you ever go on a trip it's like I've been on a trip where you're with like two months and you have almost like basically the same food like you bring the food with you like there's no like popping to the shops you have the same food and after you know to begin with it's okay. Like if you're eating dried food, if you're eating the same dried food on a big wall for like 14 days, then probably on about day five, you start like really not enjoying having the same food. But then on about day eight, you know, you start you start enjoying it again. And you just try, you just got this like the problem of variety. Because that's a problem with like people wanting to like shag loads of different people all the time. Is there? A, it's it's not about the person. It's about themselves. I think they're just they're just bored. <laughs> they're just they're just bored. But anyway, so it's but it's just about making. It's just about simplicity. Is making your diet really, really, really simple, 
And you don't have to think about it. It's a bit like the you know people wear the same clothes every day, which is actually also good advice. Is just have the same. I have two sets of clothes, and or one set of clothes that are really smelly. <laughs> and then, but yeah, but the food thing is, you just get up. Like I have for breakfast, I have four eggs. I have I have an omelette made out of four eggs, and I have um, feta cheese, some feta cheese. I buy one book of feta cheese, and that lasts me four days. And you have to put it in a you have to put it in a Tupperware box in the fridge, otherwise the water goes everywhere. And then your wife shouts at you. And um, I have one tomato that I heat up in the microwave and then chop up and then throw it onto the thing. And the trick for making an omelette, if you make, you'll get really good at making omelettes. If you have an if you have an omelette every day for like months and months and months, potentially years, you get really good at making an omelette. Now the trick with an omelette is you want to whisk your four eggs up. And you want your eggs to be room temperature. Like eggs don't go in the fridge. Like what? You, you are you an idiot? Like you know, you know. You anyway. You're going to eat them quickly anyway. So you, you know, you get through a lot of eggs. Um. So you you whisk you whisk your eggs. You chop up your you chop up your your feta cheese. You can crumble it with your hands, but it just gets everywhere. Uh. You put your thing in the microwave. Your you you don't have to, but if you're if you're soft. And then uh, you need you need the pan has to be like you put some olive oil in the pan. You could put something else in, but olive oil. And then you want to be like absolutely about to burst into flames. And you pour your eggs in, and you and uh, they'll immediately like like flash flash cook, and they'll all start. It'll cook super fast. So as soon as you put it in, give it like literally ten seconds, and then scrape all the egg into the center. And then let all the liquid like soak back around again, and then turn it down a little bit. Put on your feta cheese. Put in your 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 tomato. Put some chili flakes on it. You know, put some pepper on it. And then when it when it looks like it's almost done, fold it in half. So you only put your stuff on one side, all your your ingredients. Fold it in half, and then you can leave it for a bit. But don't let it don't let it burn. And then you then you're done amazing and then you have you have that then for lunch you just have a baked potato um the one thing about this diet is there's no pro you don't eat any wheat so there's no like there's no bread or anything like that so yeah no no cereals or anything like that so that's so that's like a, you know that's, a, that's some people find that difficult and then for lunch you have a baked potato and you can have some tuna with that you can have as much protein and as much fat as you want basically but you can have some few baked beans if you want whatever don't go but don't go crazy you know you, you got you want to you want to be out you want to cal you want your calories to be about two and a half thousand calories or something and then you and then you uh and that's it and then for for tea you have uh some some uh well i have some sauerkraut it's good for your good for your microbiome might have a baked potato because another baked potato lots of potatoes and um and s sometimes i'll just have that but but um other times i'll uh, ideally i want some protein so i'll have um you could have some steak or you can if you if you if you if you don't want to don't spend loads of money on your food just have like one beef bag or two beef bagers to play play by ear but you anyway you're playing like a long game with this kind of diet and then you've and then after and then before you go to, then you can have your mini eggs you got to put your mini eggs in the freezer so they're very very cold and you have you don't want to you don't want to have like sleep is very important for a diet so you don't want to eat any have any uh caffeine after after like about three o'clock so you have my i have my decaf cup of tea and i have the you know i have my mini eggs and uh it's like heaven, heaven on earth. Sometimes I'll have a whole thing of Hagen Das ice cream. Um, so, <laughs> and uh, but I, the way the way I visualize this kind of diet, and like every every like your your weight will go. Like I have some, like, like I have some of those like Fitbit scales. So I so I can monitor my weight like every day. It's like goes online. I can see what it is. And you know you want you want to you're playing a very long game you know, here. And I like to imagine like. Uh, um, one of those things that fall out of trees uh, that spin around. What's it called? Uh, a whirly, a whirly, whirly leaf. What are they called? What are they called? Sycamore. Is it sycamore? No. Um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. One of those things that come down. But anyway, they come down 
and uh, that's not a good analogy because they actually they just come straight down. But anyway, you want to imagine a leaf falling down or a or a snowflake or something, uh, not like a person who's anyway. But you know, and it and it comes down and it and it and it one wafts down slowly, slowly, slowly wafts. It goes up a little bit, but then it comes down and down and down, down, down. And it's like that really. It's like you know, some days you might you you might be five hundred grams heavier. Some other days, you know, you'll be like, you'll surprise yourself. And it's just uh, it's just a long, slow process of like getting down to your ideal, whatever your ideal weight will be. So, yeah, so that's anyway. So, that, so the idea was this book called Belly Timber. But um, I told Vanessa all this and she went like, that sounds like a shit idea. So, <laughs> so yeah, the, the, the other book, so I think it's gone off now. My, my other book is called. Do you know, like Jordan Peterson, the whisper his name. You know, Jordan Peterson. Um, he has this book like Ten Rules for Life. Like I always, I'm very competitive, so I thought about writing my own one called A Hundred Rules for Death instead. Like in your face, Jordan Peterson, and and it, it, this idea came about when I just saw about four people got killed in Patagonia, and I was like, that's so shit. When people, I really feel it, kind of, I kind of feel it a lot more like I take it really personally when people die climbing these days. So I was like, uh, what can I, what can I do to try and stop climbers dying? Like that's, that's the reason I wrote down is, uh, cause I don't, don't like people dying climbing. Uh, like these days I can't even watch like horror films. I started watching that. I might've said this already in, in this previous half of this podcast. I started watching that. Um, what's it? The last of us or is what those like fung fungal zombies, and I just had to turn it off. I just couldn't, I couldn't, I just didn't, I don't like really violent things anymore. So, so yeah, so this idea about doing like, it'd be like a hundred, a hundred things. Like some of the, some things would be, you know, some things would be like really basic stuff, like how to be layer properly or how to set up a, how to, you know, how to set up a be layer or whatever. But, but very simple, like we won't be one page of text and one and a one diagram and blah 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 but then it'd be things like like situational awareness or you know like like the culture you're in like you often you can have a you know you how old you you know the your 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 gender like men are more likely to die climbing than women and all that kind of stuff because just because it's a lot better and uh, and stuff like that so yeah so i was thinking i was gonna ask chris bonnington to do the often often i get someone to write i need the title they need someone to write the forward, and I thought if Chris, because Chris Bonington, I would have asked Doug Scott because Doug Scott would have done it, um, but he's dead now. But but um, like someone who's a real survivor, and I thought Chris might be the good a good person to. I'll have to email him. He probably last time I emailed him, I emailed him for his curry recipe. He never replied, so maybe he's not talking to me. So so anyway, so I'm I'm, I'm waffling on now. So anyway, we get back to this question. Um, uh, maybe you're, uh, anyway. So what, the, the man who was saying he wants he liked my Yamaha thing. Oh yeah, that was that's why I was. I, maybe I'll start after doing this. I'll start doing this podcast in the shed when I'm doing my training. Uh, maybe a recording when on the water at some point. Yeah, I'll have to. It would be quite good. Good to go. And the the Yam the Yamaha engine is really quite loud. I'd have to do it out on the on the island. Um, so a quote is, is giving me a quote here. Failure cries out for examination, whereas success, like charity, can hide a multitude of errors, which is a quote from Erwin Rommel, the field marshal, which is very good. I'll read it out again. Failure cries out for examination, whereas success, like charity, can hide a multiple of errors. Achieving a goal, (coughs) summit or destination, can appear to be the only measure of success, but especially in your extreme situations, how close have you been to the edge? Uh, sunk costs, while an economic model, costs which cannot be recovered, aka Concord costs, could this be considered in brackets or rather not considered when assessing risk? Your decision when climbing with Vanessa in the snow to not push on, or when on the troll wall, minus whiskey drinking, sal- salmon, trousers, scandy types, and climbing down both appeared to me situations where you did not continue purely on the basis of efforts already extended, but on the benefit risk of future action, 
I'm rambling now. Looking forward to any future output. Keep dressing like an Italian from Hull, Chaz. So um, that's a really good question. So, because I'm in like semi, I'm in like semi retirement from climbing at the moment, which I have. Both like most of my life, I've actually been in semi retirement from climbing. But this is like the longest period of not doing any climbing. And to be honest, at the moment, I have I have some doubts about ever doing anything dangerous again because uh i hate i hope my kids will not want to listen to this anyway but my 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 other son like noah who's like two years old uh maybe it's maybe this is like changing me why i don't like watching horror films but i i the the feel the feeling of of uh of just being away from him because i've because i've because I've, I've been so close to him because of covid and all that kind of shite that went on um the 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 idea of like going away would be would be uh is something like kind of dis- distressing to think about probably on both on both accounts really so um so yes that's something i have to kind of get my head around um and the other one don't really matter cause she's too little i don't really care about her but um so yeah so that probably was a factor with my with my other kids but it's kind of a long time ago now. And I was also a lot younger, so I probably didn't, I, I could sort of overcome those kind of things. I was a very different, like, parent then as well. So, like, not not a, like, an okay parent, but not as not as good as a parent I, as I am now. So, but maybe it's like writing a book. Like, if you want to write a book, you need to write a book first in order to write your first book. So maybe to be a parent, you need to, a good parent needs to be, of being a parent, a bad parent first to get an idea of it. So... But one thing I have think, I get because I'm like fifty one, I'm at an, an age where I, I think a lot about the things that happened in the past. Like as you get older, you're in a way your kind of opportunities sort of diminish. Like I've kind of, I I realise now that I've always I've always been a very um, like it like a lot of language you can often get trapped by language. So you could say. I was kind of self-destructive, or you could say I was, um, I was, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, what really, when you when you sort of make when you break and you stop things from uh, self, self, what do you call it when you? Oh God! I'll, I'll, anyway, when you when you, um, it's a really simple word. I just can't remember what it is. Um, when you when you make things. When you break things, break. Uh, um, uh, well, not rec- <laughs> when you when you wreck when you wreck your own life rather than other people. Do, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so so often I would kind of do things that that would actually um, reduce the chance of success by how I did them, like the people I went climbing with. Or the or the or the objectives or whatever. Like it was almost like setting out to fail from the beginning, um, which is probably true to some degree. Because then it makes you feel like you're in control in a way. Um, like I think I think that like th- this. What's the word when you when you someone comes and and oh god, what's, what's wrong with me? I must be I must be really tired. It's that stupid diet. I want. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, you're all sat in there. You're all sitting there, listening, like, going like, "Ah, this is the word, you idiot." Um, oh god, I could, I could ask Noah, but he won't. He won't. He's, he's ignorant. Um, yeah. Anyway, so but I, I've been thinking a lot about stuff like that, and uh, um, your opportunities kind of like you, you when you when you when you when you're young, you have like very few opportunities. And as you get older, you know, you create more opportunities. Like sometimes things come to you, but generally you have to go looking for them. And and then I guess I, as you get older, you tend to know more what you want. So, you, so you're very, you're more like, it, you know, the old business thing. It's like, it's what you don't do, you know, which is, is which is almost more important than what you do do. So you be, you become more channeled in your in your you know you can't just be trying to get work off everybody and trying to impress everybody you know you like focus down onto certain certain kind of things and uh, um so so but I but I, but you you kind of realize you don't get as many 
opportunities as you, as you used to. And partly that's down to, you know, like uh, down down to me personally, really. Like if you, you know, if you start spouting off about stuff and getting cross about stuff, like, you know, like, I, like, like, like since since I recorded the first half of this podcast, like someone sent me this uh, some ice climbing festival with this poster called "Me and White Supremacy," where it was asking you know climbers, white climbers, to spend do the work and think about their privilege and all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of like don't respond to this kind of stuff, you know. It's just gonna make make people hate you or whatever. You know, you're never gonna get invited to that. You're never gonna get invited to that. Um, you know, to that ice climbing festival, if you start taking the Mickey out of out of them uh, by saying something like uh, "gravity is like <laughs> gravity is like bigotry," gravity is like small minded bigotry. It doesn't it doesn't it's it's uh, color blind. Anyway, so um, uh, so yeah, so so anyway, so so you kind of I'm kind of aware. I think back about opportunities that I kind of you know, came my way and I kind of like fucked them up or just ignored them or didn't realise how amazing they were. But one thing I've one thing I actually thought a lot about is how many self sabotaging, that's the word. Self sabotaging is is often I had the opportunity to climb something or get to the top or or, you know, whatever. But I kind of self sabotaged myself. Like when I went to Denali with Vanessa I wasn't fit enough. I didn't really put any any real effort into getting super fit, which I should have. It's because I just thought, like, I'll just get fit doing it. But there was so much time sat in, sitting in a snow hole, like weeks sitting in snow holes. I didn't really get fit enough. So when it came to the point where, you know, you're like, the, the top's there, like you, you just got to walk to the summit. I just wasn't fit enough to, to be able to feel comfortable doing it and getting back down again. So, and I can think about thinking back to like the times when I was most effective was when I really, really like, when I really tried to, you know, like often, often if I was going away somewhere, I would start getting my kit, my kit together the week before, which is often too late if you're doing something where you need specialist kind of stuff. So when I went to Denali, for example, I started getting my kit, my kit together, you know, like six months before. And I and I did all I did a lot of preparation, so when we went to that mainly because I didn't want Vanessa to freeze to death on Denali in the winter time, so you know so we went we went there like almost everything was perfect. There was like there was a, there's always something right if you're ever going to do a, a a really massive trip like that you really want to like say if you're going to ski to the South Pole you really want to go to like the Hardanger Plateau in Norway, you know like a few months before in the winter time with all your kit you want all your kit prepared for that for like six months before and you go to nowhere and you do a big long trip and you realize things like like our our skis and our skins didn't really work in on denali our kicker skins uh the pulk was too heavy and everything else for a kicker skin and you know there's no way you can change that once you're on the mountain so what if you're ever going to do like a really massive uh like if you're going to do like the spine race in the uk you know it's big long race you know, you want to have all your kit. You don't want to be doing it with anything new, any new kit. Everything you need, everyone, everything you have needs to be like, you know, like really well used. You really know how it's going to work. What's, you know, what's, what's going to rub, what's not going to rub, what's going to, you know, you really want everything absolutely, you know, like about to wear out basically. And you want to have gone and done, you know, like a multiple, multi-day trips you know like you, where you go all night and stuff and uh you know work, work through all the work through all the problems and that's i think that's one of the things i really loved about climbing el cap is you'd i generally climb el cap a few times when i went to yosemite you know you, you do the first it's like a shake up you do the first route and then you come back down and then you start like tinkering everything and then you do the and then you do it go up there again and everything's so much easier because you just got your system set out and then you do it again and you you're adjusting things and I really I really really love that aspect of um, big wall climbing because it's quite complicated and there's a lot of stuff to sort of you know to work to work through so so yeah so I think I think often like I remember on like I think fitness is something I never because I'm actually quite a lazy person. Like I think fitness was something I never really 
put enough into and maybe that that affected you know that affected some things and often when i was when i was most when i climbed you know things which were quite physically difficult often it was because i had put some effort into to training beforehand like when i was doing more like alpine climbing kind of stuff i was actually a lot fitter um you can take like your fitness for granted until you get unfit and then you don't realize it like aging athlete syndrome so um so yeah so i think i think i think looking back is that I was kind of self-sabotaging and I had put like the, the idea of now going back to Denali again, like I like, I would actually quite like to go back to Denali again, but not with Vanessa. Uh, no, only, only cause she's got, we've got like these children now. So it's, it won't be good to go back. Um, both of us, um, you know, like if I went back again, well, a, like a, I know so much more now than I did before, even though I knew not a lot before I went, but now I know even more that maybe you maybe you could do without being as fit but if i went back again i'd be i'd be a lot more fitter and i'd have all this experience of being up there knowing where you go everything else and know know what to expect so you would probably be you guaranteed to to do it but if you just done it better if you just done it right the first time then you wouldn't have had this problem you know like it wasn't the weather that stopped us it was just it, we just ran out of time basically but you know why do you run out of time? You know, there's a, it's, it's it's very hard to like second guess all these things. It's it's like a, you know, like the same with like climbing Mount Kenya. Like if we would just gone and done, instead of doing like the traverse of Mount Kenya, you know, why didn't we just climb Mount Kenya by the normal route? And then by the time I went to try and do the normal route, like I was like ill, so I can hear my son shouting. So um, you know, it was a, it was a. You know, yeah, going back to Mount Kenya, like it's a lot. Like, why didn't just get it done in the first place? And then you can just, you can just move on to something else. So that's my son shouting. So I think I'm gonna have to go now. Daddy. Yes, yes, I'm doing my podcast. I don't think you can get this door open. Oh, I'm, I'm coming. Noah. <laughs> right, I better go. Uh, I think this is the, this is it for now. This is quite a long podcast in the end. And um, um, yeah. Oh, God. Okay. Until next time, stay safe.